This unit focuses on solutions and stoichiometry. The first thing that we have to make sure that we understand is the vocabulary that goes hand in hand with stoichiometry and solutions. And from the standpoint of the flow chart that you're looking at, you will find that a lot of this vocabulary you have seen before. So for example, whenever you are looking at what is called a homogeneous mixture, a homogeneous mixture is equivalent to a solution. So for example, these two terms are what we are going to call synonymous. In other words, they mean the same you will find that the term heterogeneous mixture has subcategories called colloids and suspensions. And whenever we consider what these mean, when we look at the standpoint of solutions, colloids, and suspensions, is the fact that the particle size will vary from one to the other, where you will find that a solution has particle sizes that are the smallest, colloids will be medium in size, and suspensions will be the largest. And this makes a lot of sense whenever you start thinking about what they are really like. For example, a homogeneous mixture or a solution has the smallest particle size because the particles completely dissolve and you don't have the ability to see them. A colloid has medium-sized particles. In other words, they kind of float in the solution. They don't settle to the bottom. Whereas the suspension will have the largest size particles and they literally suspend or then fall to the bottom. If you shake the solution, it will, or mixture, it will cause the suspension particles to be resuspended. Along with this goes some vocabulary terms. When we think about the term soluble, in other words, these are particles that are capable of being dissolved. And when you have particles that are capable of dis being dissolved, Let's look at the terms solvent and solute, and as we do that, I'd like you to look at the beakers that are given on the illustration. So if we call this beaker number one, if you look at beaker number one, the solute particles are the ones that are shaded in orange, the solvent particles are the blue ones. The solute is the substance that is going to be dissolved in the solvent, whereas the solvent is the substance that does the dissolving. Okay, so if the solvent then this would be something, for example, like water. And your solute, again, looking at the orange little molecules, are the ones that get dissolved. So the substance that is dissolved in the solvent. So for example, that could be sugar, table sugar, okay, as an example. So then as we go over to beaker number two, and you'll see this later in the presentation, as the solute and the solvent interact together, the solute gets dissolved and becomes interdispersed within the particles of the solvent. And eventually, as you look at beaker number three, you can see that they are completely interdispersed. And then that brings us to the topic of concentration. And when we think about concentration, if we look at the three beakers, again, this would be our first one. The middle one will be number two, followed by the third one, which is number three. As we look at these three beakers and we consider what's happening here, 
you can see that the one on the left, number one, is the least concentrated because the amount of solute particles that are in the solvent. Number two, beaker number two, has a middle amount or a medium amount of solute particles. And beaker number three, our one on the right, has the most, and thus it is considered to be the most concentrated. Typically, chemicals are things that we can't taste, but if we utilize something that we're all familiar with, let's consider a glass of water and, again, table sugar. If you add a little bit of sugar to the water, you'll taste the sugary flavor. If you add more, you'll start to find that it becomes really sweet. And finally, if you consider what's happening in beaker number three, if you add lots and lots and lots of sugar to the water and stir it and try to get it to dissolve, it may not even dissolve because it becomes so sugary, it becomes the most concentrated. That then leads us to some further terms where we look at categories called unsaturated and saturated. Starting first with unsaturated, you would be looking at the beaker on the left and the beaker in the middle, where you consider that you have consistent solutions of copper sulfate, so CuSO4, that has been added to water. And as we look at it from the standpoint of color, you'll find that the one on the left is the least colored. It's the, the most transparent even, if you will. The middle one becomes darker and the one on the right becomes the darkest. So as we go back to our terms, the one on the left and the middle one are considered to be unsaturated. In other words, the one on the left is considered to be dilute. It has the smallest quantity of solute in a solvent. Now, right now, we do not have a numerical value associated with this. Okay, so we're just using this from the standpoint of um, qualitative appearance versus quantity. Okay, so, but it has a little bit of the copper sulfate in it. As we move over to the middle beaker, where it's considered to be concentrated, this has a larger quantity of the solute and the solvent. And again, we don't have numbers associated with it yet, but we will be getting there. Okay, finally, as we move over to our beaker on the right, which is the one that almost has the very royal blue, almost purple appearance to it, this one actually has what we consider to have an excess amount of solute that has been dissolved in the solvent literally to the point that you may find that you can't get any more of it to dissolve. So when that happens, what you'll find is even upon stirring it, the excess will fall to the bottom of the container. And in your textbook, if you look on page 402, you'll see a saturated solution of sodium chloride, and this is very common. Um, when you have saturated sodium chloride, we call it brine. So then we can encounter what's called the supersaturated solution. And the supersaturated solution is very, very interesting because most children are familiar with this without them knowing that it's called a supersaturated solution because it's called rock candy. And a supersaturated solution is a situation where you have more solute than a saturated solution. And it's created very easily by heating our saturated solution. So what happens is, if you start out like you look at the test tubes, if you start out with an unsaturated solution, you're able to add in Let's use sugar as an example. You're able to add sugar to water and you can stir it, you can get it to dissolve. And eventually you create the saturated solution where you add and you add and you add, but you can't get any more of it to dissolve and it begins to settle to the bottom. Well, it's at this point right here, okay, that if you add heat,
you will be able to get all of that solute to dissolve to the point that you won't even be able to tell that it's saturated. You then allow the, the solution to sit and it's very important that when you allow it to sit, you allow it to sit undisturbed for a period of time and it cools down. And then eventually you're able to do what's called seeding. You can grow crystals by adding a seed crystal to it and it's very cool. Um, you drop the seed crystal in to your super saturated solution and literally the crystals begin to grow. And again, rock candy is made this way and sometimes um, children have seed growing kits um, where this process is explained. So throughout this portion of the lesson, you've heard me um, discuss ways of getting things to dissolve. And there's actually three factors that we want to consider. Um, number one is surface area. Surface area of the solvent is very, or solute, excuse me, is very, very important. Um, if we crush or break the solid particles into smaller pieces, in other words, we increase the surface area, this will cause the dissolving time or the rate that it takes something to dissolve to decrease. And, you know, typically, even like whenever you're doing something in the kitchen, if you take a solid pack packet of, say, for example, crystal light, and you add it to um, a pitcher, and you're adding water to it, what do you do? You stir it, and you get it to dissolve. In the chemistry lab, a mortar and pestle are used to do this. The second is agitating the solution, in other words, stirring. And the reason that this helps is because stirring helps to disperse the particles into areas of fresh solvent. So we want our solute and our solvent to interact. And whenever this dispersion occurs, it increases the surface contact. So they interact together. And finally, heating the solution. Heating the solution causes substances to dissolve faster in hot than cold. And most of us are familiar with that. And that is because particles move faster in hot solutions due to the increase in kinetic energy of the molecules. And so this final illustration shows us what we've been talking about in terms of the vocabulary. And as we look at the solution, I'm going to stop this video and you are now ready to move on to the next one called Understanding the Math.